theoretical model. And so you would have to have some factual knowledge of, of CO2, you know, some, just some little facts here and there to help you understand the behavior of CO2. And so if you, if you saw this, would you say, oh, it's electron rich because the oxygens each have a minus two charge? Or would you say it's electron poor because the carbon has a plus four charge? Uh, what would you say? Now, here's where the factual knowledge comes in. Is CO2 electron rich? If it were electron rich, it would be a nice burnable material like sugar. Sugar is electron rich. You should be able to burn this stuff. Can you burn CO2? No. I mean, if you tried to burn CO2, you, you could try to burn it to what? CO3, CO4, CO5, CO6. Do those exist? Those don't even exist. You can't burn this stuff. And so the oxygen holds on to those electrons. Those oxygens hold on to the electrons tightly. And the oxygens hold on to the electrons tightly, meaning it, o, o, oxygen, O2, is a good oxidizer. O2 is a good oxidizer, therefore it's conjugate. Oxide is, is a bad reducer because once it gains those electrons, it doesn't want to let them go. Does that make sense? And so this type of stuff we, we keep in the back of our mind. Now, now on, on the other hand, well, if oxygen's happy, we call this, I call this electron happy as is. It doesn't want to give them up. It's happy. Uh, we could look at water. You know, if we look at water, oxygen's minus two. It, is water electron rich? Can we burn the stuff? No, it's not electron rich. This is happy. You could, you could burn water. But you would need, you know, in order to burn water, you would need extremely powerful, what? Oxidizer. Extremely powerful oxidizer. If you had an extremely powerful oxidizer, what we're going to form is oxygen gas. Um, in that sense. And we probably won't get flames, but we'll get oxygen gas uh, coming out. And so there are powerful oxidizers like fluorine. Fluorine can, in fact, you know, fluorine can react violently with water, potentially. But watch out. Well, anyway, uh, because it's, it's, to fluorine this is electron rich, but to most other things it's not. You know, this is uh, unreactive. And so oxygen being minus two is no big deal. Now carbon plus four, you think, wow, plus four is really high really high and positive, right? Really high and positive, but is CO2 a good oxidizing agent? You know, is CO2 a good oxidizer like O2? If you have a CO2 fire extinguisher, wouldn't that just be fanning? Have you heard fanning the flames? Fanning the flames is give more oxygen, give more oxygen to the flame, right? So if CO2 is a good oxidizer, then if you have your fire extinguisher and you're trying to put out the flames, that's the wrong thing to do because it's going to, to fan the flames. Does that make sense? CO2 will fan the flames of an ordinary fire. No, it won't. But CO2 will fan the flames of an unusual fire. You know, CO2 is a decent oxidizer as long as you have a strong reducer. And therefore, on, if you ever read the CO2 fire extinguisher, it says never use this on, well, grease, grease is different because of the intensity. Never use this on metal fires. If you use this on a metal fire, you're fanning the flames. You're just adding more O2 kind of thing. Does that make sense? Because uh, metals are powerful reducers. And so CO2 is plenty enough powerful oxidizer to oxidize metals. And so th this is, uh, this is a, a case, you know, one, you never want to use water on a metal fire because you think water, well, water should put out the fire, but no, water can be an oxidizer, like the sodium. And so I, I guess it, there was a lithium uh, battery plant on fire, and I don't know, I, I think they used water, maybe they used CO2, but they definitely used water. It was a disaster because what happened was the water just made everything much worse. Right? And then CO2 can make a metal fire much worse okay, by just adding more oxidizer. But um, as far as being electron rich or electron poor, CO2 is pretty <coughs> unreactive, don't you think? 
And when we exhale CO2, it doesn't really react with much, does it? The water makes it a little acidic. And so we register this in our mind. You know, CO2 is not really electron rich, it's not really electron poor, it's fairly stable, right? Because it's the product of combustion. The product of combustion is CO2 and water. And those are fairly stable products. Which brings us to carbonate. Carbonate is, is, where did those extra electrons go? Well, there's an imbalance of electrons because carbon's plus four, oxygen is minus two, that gives us two extra electrons, but those two extra electrons went somewhere. The two extra electrons went to the extra oxygen. Just because it has a negative two charge, is this gonna be freely throwing out electrons? No, and in fact, I don't consider carbonate electron rich at all. It's just like water or whatever else, you know. And so, um, the same thing with carbon monoxide. It's just happy as is. You know, the carbon, carbonate can also be an oxidizer as well. Ammonia, on the other hand, is like this. Ammonia, nitrogen has minus three, uh, hydrogen is plus one oxidation state. For oxidation states, we normally write plus one. For something called formal charge, we usually just write a plus and circle it, no one. But, you know, is hydrogen in the plus unusual? No. Is it electron poor? Well, it depends. In water, definitely not. In some acids, yeah, you know, it might be. And so when I look at hydrogen, this doesn't phase me at all. But what I focus my attention on is nitrogen. Now this is nit ammonia. Can you burn ammonia? You certainly can burn ammonia. You form toxic gases, so you don't want to burn it. You know? if, you burn, um, if you burn ammonia and methane together, you could form Potentially, under certain conditions, you can form hydrogen cyanide gas. Hydrogen cyanide gas is very toxic. Very careful with that. At the very least, you're going to form NOx. NOx are toxic. And so this is the most electron-rich species. Chloride is chloride. You know, can you burn table salt? No. No. And so this comes from a little bit of factual knowledge and, and um, trying to interpret the numbers, what the numbers mean. It, that's memorization. Would combustibility be a good gauge? Combustibility is always a good gauge. All reducing agents are combustible. combustible. That, that, you know, if you, if you get a, a bottle of copper metal, you know what it says on there? Flammable. It's copper. You know, but it, it, usually they write flammable on powdered copper metal. Powdered iron, you know, uh, it, iron uh, yeah, iron filings. You see the sparks come out of um, when people are grinding iron. No, that's iron burning. But actually, do I, if I had some steel wool, you know, if you have some steel wool, you can catch it on fire. It's easy. You know, iron's combustible. I I have some steel wool, but it's probably back there. I'll bring some. But metal metal filings and powdered metals are highly flammable. Potentially explosive, you know, if you get a dust cloud of metal, you know, uh, explosive reaction. Uh, like the grain silos, you know, if you have a dust cloud of flour, mm -hmm. like cooking flour, um, that can be very explosive. Have you seen those? Yeah. Grain silo explosions? Extremely violent. Some bakeries have it too because there's dust up in the ceiling and then some spark and then destroys the entire bakery. It's, that's, that's all kinetics, you know. Um, normally flour burns slowly, but under the right conditions it could burn explosively. Just like metals, you know. Depends on the conditions. How it reacts. All right, uh, other questions? On that?